So I'm just going to introduce our speaker, Adriana Davis. Uh, she has been working as a researcher, editor, lecturer, executive director, curator for over 40 years. Uh, she's the author of several books, including her new work on Italian immigration to Alberta, which is available in our gift shop. And her talk today is going to focus on Italian immigration um, to the Lethbridge area in particular. She's joining us from Edmonton, correct? Um, and the talk is being recorded, so anything you ask out loud after pretty much this point will be forever captured in our archives on the internet. So don't spill any family secrets right now. And I'll let her, I'll let her go. And I'll be on hand if there's any technical difficulties. Thanks so much, Carolyn. I'm delighted that uh, the Galt has invited me uh, to do this um, presentation. Um, you know, my first visit to the Galt Museum, as I mentioned, was uh, in early January of 1987, just after I became executive director of the Alberta Museums Association. They were hosting the conference that fall, and I've had a very close bond. And of course, I mean, as you will hear from my presentation, I used um, the archives um, extensively, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, how wonderful your archive is and the invaluable material that I found there with the assistance of Andrew. So I'll begin by saying that you've, you've done a wonderful job. So my intention is basically to, to do a few minutes, about maybe five or six minutes, general introduction. Then we'll go into the PowerPoint and I'll show you different images from different sections. And I'll, I'll do the readings from the book um, focused um, on, on that. And in case you haven't seen the book, there it is from Sojourners to Citizens, Alberta's Italian History. The book has been many, many years in the making. Um, in 1983, I took part in the first oral history project with Edmonton's Italian community. And then around 2015, the Edmonton Heritage Council for its cultural mapping project asked me to do the Italian community. And so I went in my basement, all of these boxes of, of materials going back to 1983. And I thought afterwards, if I drop dead, you know, my sons may take this to the dump. Oh, horror. And, you know, all of this knowledge in these boxes and in my head is going to be lost. And so that's when I determined to write the book. So I'll begin with an edgy statement. Immigration was racist. From the late 19th century to the 1950s, British colonies such as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as the US government, viewed British and Northern Europeans as the most desirable settlers. Southern and Eastern Europeans, Asians, South East, Southeast Asians, Africans, and other races were considered less desirable. The reasons for selective immigration and the need for assimilation and Canadianization of settlers was made clear by J.S. James Shaver Woodsworth, who was the superintendent of the All People's Mission in Winnipeg. In his book, Strangers Within Our Gates, Coming Canadians, the book was published in 1909 by the Missionary Society of the Methodist Church of Canada and had a number of editions, so it was a hot commodity. The chapter sequence in Strangers Within Our Gates can be viewed as a ranking of races from most to least desirable. It is as follows, Great Britain, United States, including the Mormons, Scandinavians, including Icelanders, Germans, including the Mennonites, French, Southeastern Europe, including Russians, Dukabors, Lithuanians, Austria-Hungary, including Bohemians, Slovaks, Ruthenians, Poles, Hungarians, Balkan states, Hebrews, Italians, North and South, Levantine races, including Greeks, Turks, Armenians, Syrians, Persians, Orientals, including Chinese, Japanese, Hindus, and Negro and Indian. You know, so that was the lineup. The tone of the book is fear mongering. 
The prefatory section titled Immigration, a World Problem, describes a vast and endless army marching from northern, eastern and southern Europe at the rate of 1.5 million per year towards the civilized world. It is further described as an invading army. Now you think, my God, aren't we a lot smarter today? Well, think about the US, for example, and, and it's turning against um, immigrants, um, you know, from um, Latin and South America, let alone other areas, and the profound um, racism that we're that is being experienced in the US and Canada against Muslims, Chinese, and, and others. In the period 1861 to 1914, about 14 million Italians emigrated. They wanted to work abroad for a better life. The primary destinations were the US, Canada, Australia, and Argentina. They also want, went to work in France, Germany, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Of these, 69.5% uh, were from Northern Italy. By 1914, more were coming from Southern Italy. So you get a flip and you wonder, well, you know, why were they coming from Northern Italy? Well, the various steamship companies that also, um, you know, the, the transported immigrants um, also um, sponsored labor agents. And a number of the offices were located on the Swiss Italian border. So it was very simple. Um, and because uh, Italian uh, land holdings, uh, inheritance didn't go to the first son, uh, it was divided. These mountainous land holdings became more and more minuscule and they couldn't, um, they couldn't keep um, a large family. And you had large children as a kind of insurance. They were there to help you farm and, 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 and to do other laboring work and to keep the family afloat. So two thirds of the immigration in the first era was from the North. And they went to Canada, Australia, and Argentina, as I said, as well as other parts of Europe. Um, very few were allowed in, in the period 1919 to 1949, because of restrictive immigration practices that allowed in only agricultural workers, mostly through family reunification. And although Italy was not an enemy alien state in the First World War, it was still treated like that because it hedged its bets. Was it going to side um, with, uh, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Germans, or was it, or was it going to side with the Allies? Eventually, it sided with the Allies, but this somehow rankled. The majority of the individuals who came over were men described in their passports as bracciante, and braccia, of course, is arm. So in other words, they were laborers, uh, manual laborers. And they were also sojourners. They were temporary workers, mostly brought in to the US to work on the railways and other construction work. There were extensive labor chains. Um, you know, they would arrive at Ellis Island, New York, and then scatter westward um, in the latter half of the 19th century, which was a great era of railway building and settlement with resource industry development and the creation of, of the infrastructure of um, towns and cities. Canadian Pacific Railway hired Italians through several contractors because they had a reputation for being hard workers. And when I found this quotation, it blew me away. Uh, CPR president, Thomas Shaughnessy observed, men who seek employment on railway construction are as a rule, a class accustomed to roughing. They know when they go to work that they must put up with the most primitive kind of camp accommodation. I feel very strongly that it would be a huge mistake to send out any more of these men from Wales, Scotland, or England. It is prejudicial to the cause of immigration to import men who come here expecting to get high wages, a feather bed, and a bathtub. And so it gives you an idea of, in the, of the kind of conditions then that these uh, railway workers lived in. 
Uh, many Italian laborers moved westward in the US and then northward to the Pacific Northwest and then into British Columbia and Alberta. Census records and Ellis Island immigration files indicate enormous mobility, some even coming to the US and then Canada via Australia and Argentina, as well as various European countries. And these examples are in the book. Montreal and Toronto were the Canadian labor hubs and men went westward working on the construction of not only the Canadian Pacific Railway, but also a number of branch lines across the country. From the late 1880s, extensive coal mining activity occurred from Fernie in southeastern BC through the Crow's Nest Pass to Lethbridge and Drumheller. Mining also occurred on the eastern slopes of the Rockies at Nordegg, Mountain Park, and other coal branch communities. Also, extensive mines um, existed in the Edmonton area, over 200 of them. Um, and um, you know, this was also a, a time of huge um, casualties. Um, and I'll give you some examples of mining disasters. But I'll make one other observation. In the Crow's Nest Pass, communities such as Blairmore and Coleman, um, about 20% of the mining work workforce was Italian. So that was significant. Probably in Lethbridge, I would say anywhere from 12 to 15% was Italian. The issue of mine safety was significant. In the period 1902 to 1914, the coal mining region from BC's Elk Valley through the Crow's Nest region had seen a number of serious accidents. In May 1902, 128 miners were killed in the number two mine in Coal Creek near Fernie. The Frank mine disaster in 1903 resulted in the death of between 70 to 90 men when it destroyed the mine and part of the town. In 1910, 31 men were killed at the Bellevue mine. And in 1914, 189 men were killed in the Hillcrest mine. 29 were Italian. And there were no safety nets to protect um, injured or ill workers. So they created their own, hearkening back to so-called fraternal societies established in Italy beginning in the 1860s. Um, and they, they, the, in North America, um, in the US, they were called Ordine Indipendente Figli d'Italia, the Independent Order Sons of Italy. And they, of course, came into Italian mining communities. Although originally, uh, for example, in the mines at Lille, 1906, their affiliation was with uh, a mining societies in Colorado, for example. Um, and But later they became part of the Independent Order Sons of Italy. In 1929, the dozen branches of the, uh, of the Figli d'Italia with headquarters in Ferni. These included all of the Alberta fraternal societies, separated from their American counterparts and created the Ordine Independente Fior d'Italia, the independent order flower of Italy. And of course, youth were the flower. And so, and also of course the initials were the same. So all the stockpile of ribbons they had with these initials could be recycled. Um, including the letterhead. So, you know, these became very important. And as I mentioned, Crow's Nest Museum has records dating back to 1906, for the um, Lil Mine disaster, including minutes, due books, and financial records. And it was very haunting for me, you know, when uh, the Galt did the year of the coal miner exhibit, and I did the exhibit on people of the coal mines, the Italian community. Um, to actually look at those records and to begin to recognize the names. And, you know, with Ron Ulrich, the executive director of the Galt at the time, we visited the Hell Crest Mine Disaster Site and I looked at the graveyards. So those names are, are really etched in, in my memory. The first decade of the 20th century, the, the sojourners had decided to settle in Alberta joining the thousands of other immigrants enticed by government campaigns with the slogan, um, go west young man. Family reunification began and Italian communities developed. Agricultural settlement began around 1908 to 1910 in central Alberta at Naples. 
the Lethbridge area, and in 1914, an Italian agricultural colony was established in northern Alberta near Lac La Biche at Venice and Hilo. Not everyone wanted to work in the mines. So, you know, a farm or setting up as a shopkeeper or a tradesman, you know, ent enticed people. From the earliest days, you saw an emphasis on education. And by the second generation, other than in mining communities where you could have five generations of miners, in other parts of the province, uh, particularly in agricultural areas, including the Lethbridge area, um, you know, children went to school. And so you had the movement out of the working class into, into the middle class. Um, and an interesting phenomenon is that it, when Mussolini came to power, um, he was very interested in the Italians living abroad. So in winter in January of 1922-23, um, uh, he sent the granddaughter of, of uh, the great Italian uh, freedom fighter, Giuseppe Garibaldi, to set up agricultural colonies. And so she came and visited Edmonton, Calgary, and also um, Venice. And of course, after her departure, a number of fascist cells, um, fasci, were set up in Edmonton and Calgary, um, Lethbridge. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that later. In the period 1948 to 75, about 100, 375 Italians immigrated to Canada, many in response to government labor pro programs. I mean, Canada was beginning a post-war boom with uh, the petroleum industry in Alberta, for example, the coming in of the Leduc number one well, and all sorts of other um, construction and developments. And so you saw a huge boom. The first surge occurred in 1951 when um, over 24,000 came, and this became the average until 1967. The peak year was 1968 when um, nearly 32,000 came to Canada. Um, according to census records, Canada's total Italian population increased from just over 150,000 in 1951 to 450,000 in 1961. In Alberta, there were just under 6,000 individuals of Italian ethnic origin in 1951, over 15,000 in 1961, nearly 25,000 in 1971, and nearly 27,000 in 1981. Thus, Alberta's Italian community more than quadrupled in 30 years. By 1996, the number was uh, about 59,000, and by 2011, um, nearly 89,000 indicated Italian ancestry in, in the census, thus about 2.5% of the province's population. You know, thus the very success of Italian Im immigrants in professionalizing and becoming Canadian has eroded the sense of a distinct Italian community. Because initially, you know, you saw in from the 50s onward, establishment of Italian societies, including the Romulus and Remus Club, Italian society in Lethbridge. But of course, um, as the seniors, um, uh, you know, the seniors in the 1980s, when a bunch of oral histories were done, were already lamenting that the younger generation was becoming Canadian. And that sense of Italian identity was being lost. Um, in Calgary, revitalization of the Calgary Italian Club occurred because of the large numbers of, in the community and also because the Italian language school and other activities had an appeal for the community at large. Um, the uh, Romulus and Remus Society in Lethbridge was incredibly active, but also as the seniors were dying off and now all of those young men and their wives who came in the, in the 50s and 60s are gone. Um, so that the club has allowed individuals of other ethnicity, and of course, it's it, it's thriving. So that's the overview. I'm now going to go to share screen.
and hopefully I will be able to do the PowerPoint. <laughs> now, the, we've mentioned the era of ra railway building, and I do deal with that in the, um, in the book and some of the families who came. But I think I'll start my readings from um, when coal was king. And of course, you can see that I, the East Kootenays of BC, the, the, the through the Crow's Nest Pass, and um, through Lethbridge to Drumheller. I mean, that was a natural area. And the, uh, the workforce was very mobile and they moved from one region to the other. And so I'm just going to show you a few. Uh, there's the miners at the entrance of the Pacific Coal Company mine in Bankhead around uh, the 1900s. So the mine was a subsidiary of the Canadian Pacific Railway, and of course, a number of work of Italians worked in, in that mine. And there is a photograph of, of victims of the Hillcrest mine disaster, June the 19th, 1914. It was the worst coal mining disaster in Canadian history. And, um, you know, the, the, they were buried in, in, in mass graves. So you can see all of the activity. There are a number of fascinating photographs. And of course, because of that disaster, a number of Italian families decided to move to Calgary to begin new lives um, and you know, not work in the mines. Now here's a, an early um, Italian family from Lethbridge. Uh, Giuseppe, Joe and Teresa Berlando with sons Aurelio, Roy and Giulio in a studio portrait taken in, 1906 in Riva on Lake Garda prior to immigration. And of course they were uh, Northern Italians. Teresa's brother, Benjamino Giste also immigrated. Um, as you, and Joe arrived in Lethbridge in 1907 and went to work in the mines in the region. So the first reading I'll do is to do with um, mining history. Census records reveal that Italian immigrants' immigration to Lethbridge in the early decades of the 20th century was limited. The Italian population numbered 19 in 1911, but increased to 204 by 1921. Um, the majority worked in the mines. Other mining communities developed in the region, among them Diamond City in 1905, Coalhurst, originally Bridge End in 1911, and Commerce, originally Colgate in 1912. A significant number of Italian workers resided in these communities. For example, by 1921, Coalhurst had 99 Italians and Commerce had 92. The Chinook Company limited mines in Commerce and Coalhurst in 1918 had 43 and 29 Italian workers respectively of a total of 166 and 366. While Lethbridge grew as the regional urban center providing a range of services, the development of the other communities strictly depended on the health of the mines. Colgate was a boom and bust community with a peak population of 360 in 1921. But with the closure of the Chinook mine in 1924, the population dwindled to about 100. It finally dissolved in 1926. The mine in Colhurst, located northwest of Lethbridge, continued to prosper, and the town had a population of about 1,200 in 1935, when disaster, disaster struck the Imperial Mine. Afterwards, most immigrant miners moved to Lethbridge for work, but the community survived because agriculture was well established. Historian Howard Palmer noted that the 204 Italians in Lethbridge in 1921 were likely mostly single, single miners who lived on the north side. In fact, many were married and had families. I mean, I've done um, a lot of searches <coughs> on ancestry and also 
um, uh, uh, census records. And of course, these founding families included the Armacoras, Simeones, Bacedas, Lizis, Locatellis, Bridarolas, Valerios, uh, um, Catois, Quistes, and others. Um, and we've seen that the Berlando Berlanda family, of course, were related to the Quista. So you saw these families sponsoring each other's. Well, there are conventional histories of Lethbridge. There's no community history to pr provide immigrant stories. However, some Lethbridge mining families are found in our treasured heritage, a history of Culver's and district and the history of Diamond City and commerce. Since the men moved from mine to mine in the region, as with other mining communities, many of the Italian families came from Northern Italy. Now, I'll read you a little bit about the Colhurst mine disaster, which occurred on December 9th, 1935. Between 4 and 4.30 p.m., while shifts were changing, a methane explosion deep in the mine killed 16 miners. Now, imagine what the stats would have been if the, if the mine was fully functional. Um, and of course, they recovered the 16 bodies and three trips underground. The casualties included three Italians dead, Angelo Ermacora, father of 10, Albino Simeone, single, and E. Rota, a father of two, and one injured, John Saccardo. And what's fascinating, um, and of course, those materials are in your archive, Funerals took place on Friday, December 13th. Mayor D.H. Elton of Lethbridge arranged for a special train to bring up up to 400 more mourners from Italian, from mining communities from the Crow's Nest Pass to Drumheller. Reflecting the different religious denominations of those killed, there were three church services, a 9 a.m. Catholic Mass at the Greek Catholic Church in North Lethbridge a 10 a.m. Mass at St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church and a Protestant service at 3 p.m. A funeral cortege comprising numerous cars brought families and mourners to the Catholic and Protestant ceremonies in the city. And over 5,000 mourners gathered at the cemeteries. So that gives you an idea, you know, of, uh, you know, some details of the community. And here is the Hunger March in Calgary, Alberta, 1932. Now, what's interesting is that um, the photographer is um, Roy Berlando. Um, and of course, you saw him in that family immigration formal portrait. And he seems to have done photographs. Um, he worked in Drumheller in the mines, um, uh, you know, in Drumheller and also in Calgary and um, Edmonton. And as I've mentioned, Italians were um, strong union supporters and the strike in Drumheller lasted the longest of any of the strikes in um, uh, resulting from the 1919 Winnipeg general strike. Um, and uh, miners, including a number of Italians in Drumheller were charged by mounted police. And here's the website that was developed uh, 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 as a result of the uh, People of the Coal Mines um, project uh, with the GALT. And so you can, you can search that site and find out additional information. Now, with respect to um, uh, the agricultural um, settlement, of course, uh, you know, the, the uh, government of Canada was holding these fairs, not only in Europe, um, but also, of course, in various parts of the United States. And they were promoting the notion of, of Alberta as, as a wheat belt. And of course, the Canadian Pacific Railway Irrigation and Colonization Company also made available um, farmland because of course it had a sweetheart deal from the federal government to build um, the railway. So not only had the railway um, rights, uh, but also, I mean, some town sites and agricultural um, land. And uh, with respect to some prominent farming families in Alberta, 
the Angelozzo uh, um, brothers um, who changed their name to Battle. Uh, very few Italians did, but in the Delia era, area, several did. And so we're very successful at, at farming. Now, here is a prominent um, Lethbridge family, the Fabis, and I'll read you uh, some of their adventures. Oops. A number of Italian families developed dairy herds, um, including the Pavans and Fabis. He began by making deliveries to local homes and then moved on to establish dairies. Giuseppe Gio Pavan, a farm boy, left Breva di Piave Treviso, again north, and arrived in Lethbridge in March 1911. According to daughter Ginger Erickson, he brought with him an English-Italian dictionary. For five months, he worked for the city laying mains and wooden sewer pipes, and in 1912, went to work as a fireman in the number three mine. He was joined by fiance Maria Morandin in August 1914, and they were married. While focusing on establishing himself on a solid footing in the new land, he did not forget his family in Italy. In 1912, he sponsored brother Giovanni. In 1914, his brother Antonio, and in 1921, brother Pietro. Joe had a dream of having a farm of his own. The couple saved, and in 1917, they were able to put down a payment of 1,500 on the cave estate, comprising 32 hectares, located northeast of Hardyville. Ginger knows times were hard and money was scarce. The money from the job at the mine was needed, so Dad continued to work at the mine on eight hour shifts. It was either 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. or 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. Or, or 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. He also carried on with his farm work between shifts during the day. Dad and mother moved out to the farm on March the 19th, 1918 with their three children, Louis, Marguerite and Elide. So you can imagine, you know, the wife and children, um, you know, operated this and, uh, by the early 1930s, he had purchased a delivery truck and had Pavan dairy painted on the doors. Ginger described the dairy operations as follows. The cows are milked in the morning before, he went to, before we went to school and again in late afternoon. That day's milk was bottled and some was separated for cream, then put into a cooler for the next morning's early delivery. The milk was cooled and kept cool by the tons of ice that had been harvested in the winter months when the ice was thickest on the lake. So Im imagine the heavy um, labor. Um, now I'll just read you a little bit about the Fabi family. Simeon, Fabi and wife Laura left Rome and came to Alberta in 1911, settling on a farm near the CPR line north of Lethbridge. In 1923, they made the decision to leave farming and move to Lethbridge and start a dairy. Purity Dairy was a very basic operation run by the couple held by sons Stanley, Eugene and, and Romeo. Romeo described it as follows. Our parents cared for the cows. The milk was just strained through a flannel cloth measured into five pound red lard pails, a very generous quart, and then delivered morning and night to neighborhood customers. Well, after two years, they were they expanded and uh, they purchased um, a, a house near St. Basil School um and which had a barn and that became their operation they eventually expanded um into um uh the the, uh, the majestic cinema which became their dairy and 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 eventually expanded deliveries to medicine hat and calgary to Tabor. Fort McLeod, and Heller, Red Deer, and Southwestern BC. By 1962, they, um, they were thinking of premises in Edmonton. And so, of course, they were the last privately owned dairy in Alberta, which was huge. And um, it, it eventually was purchased by the Italian company Parmalat, you know, which is, which is intriguing, uh, you know, what, goes round, comes round.
So um, there, there you go with them. The Venice settlement, of course, there you go, 1914. There they are at the railway station heading up. And now this one was sponsored by um, the Italian government and consular agent Felice De Angelis, um, uh, who was a civil engineer, led the settlers. We also had some very interesting um, uh, ranchers, among them George Bocatera, who was from a minor aristocratic family, and he had fallen in love with the West by reading the novels by American James Fen Fenimore Cooper, and he arrived in Calgary in 1903 and established his own ranch. Now, I mentioned that, of course, a number of them became entrepreneurs, and probably the most notorious one was um, for any businessman, Emilio Picariello, who ran the pasta factory there. Um, and also then, of course, with the coming of Prohibition, um, he purchased the Alberta Hotel in Blairmore um, from Fritz Sick, uh, which be, then became the basis of, of his bootlegging business. But he was a very successful um, entrepreneur. In terms of Medicine Hat, um, the Cantellini family uh, became very prominent. And um, in my book, I discussed that probably uh, bootlegging was the source of the family's wealth, uh, but they ran a number of hotels. Um, and uh, there is the Pafan family in front of their store in Colhurst, um, Alberta. Um, and then in Drumheller, you have um, uh, Curly Miliarina in front of, uh, of his People's Bakery. And I mean, they were incredible marketers. They even had uh, bronze tokens, um, you know, that you could get to purchase bread. Now, what's um, intriguing is um, we return to Lethbridge and you have the Dorigati Faf construction. Um, Art Dorigati, who established himself in construction, um, and Emile Faf uh, joined, merged their companies in 1959, 55, sorry, um, to be, be able to better compete for residential and, and government contracts. And remember that in the early 50s, it was a post-war boom, so that there were schools and subdivisions and so on being built. And of course, Dorigati and Fa built a number of those subdivisions. And, and of course, I, I talk about that in the book. Dorigati also uh, built St. Basil's Church and also rebuilt um, St. Patrick's Roman Catholic churches. Um, so he was enormously successful. Um, then you, the Marquis Hotel, of course, which, uh, you know, uh, it no longer exists, but from 1962 to 68, the bakery was operated by Roger Sergo. Um, and so there is the uh, postcard of this marvelous building. Now, I mentioned em, enemy, del, um, there's Italia Garibaldi on the visit to Edmonton and the media in both Edmonton and um, Calgary lionized her. And she was at points to, and look at the headline, Signorina Italia Garibaldi, who is visiting Canada in the interest of the fascist movement in Italy. And look at the other headline, men who overthrew communists in Italy would bring wives and families to Alberta's farms. And Garibaldi extolled the work ethic of Northern Italians and, and their suitability to farm in Alberta. Now, remember that um, at this time you had um, the, well, you know, the Drylands a Congress happened in that period, 1922-23, and there was the desire through irrigation to open up marginal land in the, in the Lethbridge area. So in, in, on December the 8th, 1926, the, um, the provincial fascia was set up um, at a meeting in Calgary. And there's the picture of Felice de Angelis, the Italian consul, who continued to come back to Alberta, uh, to Venice Hilo um, in, in his fascist uniform. 
And uh, there was a debate in the, um, uh, in the pages of the Calgary Herald because they initially, they ran a very favorable article on the founding of the provincial class show. But then Alex Pico, who was a member of the local Calgary Lodge, attacked um, fascism. And so this uh, debate uh, was in, on the front pages of the um, Calgary Herald. And there is Antonio Revolengo, who is the consular agent in Calgary and who worked for the railways um, in the Ripple's prisoner of war camp. Um, actually, I should have changed that. I didn't. I later discovered that it was um, the Ripple's camp. And he was in the camp for three years until Italy was defeated in 1943. Now we move into the um, post-war wave of immigration. And uh, a lot of people went to work for Imperial Oil. And my own father, Raffaele Albi, who was a master carpenter, um, worked there, as well as other Italians. Um, but they worked on, you know, in, in other um, communities throughout Alberta. Uh, a, a number of people worked in the Atco trailer manufacturing plant at Airdrie, because of course, you know, with all of this construction going on, not only at um, petroleum sites, but also other sites, ATCO trailers, of course, were in huge demand. And um, in Calgary, you had uh, the uh, families going into the um, clothing manufacturing uh, in 1971, Pete and Ida Fornaro. Um, uh, renamed the new Hatchware Uniforms Company. Um, there's a group departing Italy. And uh, we'll move to Italian organizations. And clearly the most, the oldest, uh, of course, is related to, I mentioned Lille, but then, of course, when that, um, uh, the mine was shut down, um, uh, the mines in, in Coleman then became the center of, of uh, the, uh, the Fraternal Society and they actually built a hall and there, there it is. Um, it was built in 1912 um, and it's number three. So clearly Fernie was number one, Lil was number two and this was number three. Now, what's interesting, of course, is that all of the Alberta uh, fraternal societies, male and female, met um, annually for a conference. So there they are with their sashes and uh, their flag and so on. So all, all, all of these names uh, were significant um, names in their community, as well as the um, um, uh, you know, in, in, in the Italian societies. Now, what's interesting is, was that, um, you know, that there were models in other fraternal societies, not non-Italian ones, like the Rebecca's and other female lodges. So the Italian societies began to create um, ladies fraternal societies. Now I do, now we get to Lethbridge and this, the Loggia Operaia, Numero sei, the the, uh, the number six um, um, workers' lodge in Lethbridge was established in 1918, and this photograph is the only documentary evidence of its existence. And it, according to the Romulus and Remus Society, it was taken in uh, circa 1922, 1920 to 25. In fact. I would put the date closer because in doing the research on the internment, the, uh, the Lethbridge Lodge was a casualty of the battle between fascism and non-fascism. So um, it, it discontinued likely after that 1926 um, establishment of the provincial fascio. And of course we have the names of all of them. And you still see, you know, 
Briveroli, uh, Matteotti, all, all of these uh, people, um, some of whom, of course, also worked in the um, in the mines in Lethbridge. And now I'll close with the Romulus and Remus Lethbridge Italian Club, which uh, has this wonderful, your archives has this wonderful image, uh, circa 1949. Now, this is prior to the, the later foundation of, of the society. Um, and you, you see you've got Camilla Briteroli, Bichiste, Locatelli families, or, I mean, we've seen them in the mining records, Baceda, and uh, an unidentified Slav woman. The Italian Canadian club that, you know, also known as the Romulus and Remus club was slightly later creation and uh, there they are off to Expo 1986 and our an article from the Lethbridge um, Herald. Okay, um, any observations, questions? I've got a kick out of that last one where it says slab woman. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't ask for her name, could they? Well, you see that you, but that's the issue. I mean, archives frequently don't have this information. And I'd like to point out that, you know, I was able to access these various materials. You remember Ginger Erickson who donated family materials and, and others. If they hadn't donated those, I wouldn't have been able to tell these Lethbridge stories. And so we are now at another intergenerational transfer of heritage. So I strongly recommend to families that um, if they don't want to give the originals, photographs, documents, letters, memoirs, give copies to the local archive to help historian, future historians. Gonna have to I'm give you to show stuff. those pictures up there of the, it's my mom and dad and my grandfather. Yeah. Do you want to say something about that? No, I really enjoy seeing them all the time. <laughs> oh, good, good. At home, you know, the big crow's nest past book and it's got the pictures in it. But it's yeah. always nice and a big surprise when I see them again. Good. Well, you know, I mean, Crow's Nest and its people was a wonderful resource. I mean, in terms of, you know, not just mining communities, but, you know, agricultural communities and others. I mean, you you know, two volumes, I mean, you know, family histories. Now, when the province funded those, academic historians turned their noses up at them. I mean, they said, why don't they fund universities' histories? But in fact, I mean, for social historians and immigration historians like myself, this is raw material that, you know, what I've drawn on again and again. So it was, it was incredibly valuable. Well, Any pictures, uh, pictures of the, uh, the lodge in both of them. My dad is still single. And in the one with the women's in the lodge, that was before my mother got married to my dad. So oh. to see them when they weren't married. <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the photograph, of course, they got at, at Glenbow, but also the Crow's Nest uh, Museum has a bunch of those photographs. I've looked at them and I was able in, in uh, to, you know, where they have a question mark and then the surname. I was able, because of my knowledge of the mining records, I was able to put in names because, of course, I looked at the minute books um, of um, and also the fee books, uh, you know, uh, there. And any other questions, observations? I have a question for you. I know you knew a lot about Italian history before you went to write the book. Was there anything that surprised you or that was unexpected when you did more research? Well, you know, when I, you know, the initial research that I did was in 83. 
you know, for this project, Italian Settled in Edmonton Historical Project. And by then, the historians, and they were basically Ontario and Quebec historians at that point, they were talking about the majority of immigrants coming from the South. And that myth was perpetuated. And I think that I'm really the first one. And some of the oral historians, uh, the oral history say this, that this huge wave of immigration, two thirds were from the North until 1914. And so to me, that was staggering. And that it was, and, and I discovered that because, you know, um, Italian historians were, looking at census records and, uh, and immigration records. And there, it, I found a source on the web. And so I, I was able then to exploit that. So that then when I went back, cause I read, I don't know about 300 of the oral histories, not the oral histories, the community histories looking for Italian names, you know, that's, um, and of course I've listened to all of the oral histories uh, the provincial archives, um, you know, we gifted those um, as did the Dante Alighieri Society. And then in, at the Glenbow, the Calgary Italian Club, Club did a series and also Howard Palmer did People of Southern Alberta. Then I was able to correlate, you know, and you notice where people come from. I put that in, in, in every in, instance. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I have a question, kind of unrelated to your book, but my, my father immigrated in 49. Yeah. He, he did exactly what you said. He worked on a farm for a while and then the CPR snagged him up. But anyways, right now he's 92. He lives in a congregated living facility here in Lethbridge. And he's been busy for the last couple of years writing his memoirs. The only problem is they're in Italian. And uh, I wonder if you know anybody or Oh, I can translate it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Carolyn, put us in touch. It's, I mean, it'd be a lengthy. I'd love to see it. I mean, I don't think there's another Italian book in, for me, but I could do an essay, you know. Right. And uh, it might be interesting that maybe this is the beginning of. <coughs> donations to the Galt archives that I could then look at and maybe write a paper or do another presentation. There you go. Uh, yeah, he started it uh, writing it by hand and then said, yeah, you gotta get a laptop, you gotta get a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but you see that, that flowing handwriting, uh, you can imagine how much I've had to decipher, but it's hard. We've got, got him on a typewriter now. Like an actual typewriter? Yeah, yeah. He's okay with that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, no, I have your email for the tickets you bought. Were, uh, were the fascistas quite strong in the Crow's Nest Pact, you know? Sorry, the? The, the fascists, were they quite strong in the Crow's Nest Pact? Or did no. they get a chance to go anywhere? That's interesting. Um, basically, uh, you know, over... About 650 were interned, Italians from across the country. As you would expect, you know, at least two thirds or, or more from, were from Ontario and Quebec. I mean, they used the Casa d'Italia lists, um, you know, the Italian uh, society lists. Uh, uh, from BC, if memory serves, it's about 60 to 65. A few were minors, but I would say the majority were from uh, the greater Vancouver area and they were um, shopkeepers, tradesmen and, and so on. Um, Nordig, um, I gather had the, the, you know, the minor society there, I, heard anecdotally that quite a number were were fascist but of course there were no arrests from that area from Alberta there were six um, and um, Antonio de Valengo was uh, from Calgary was the one who served the longest 
Um, there were um, two arrests from um, Venice, Hilo. So, you know, one from uh, Central Alberta near Red Deer um, and, an, and another from, um, he worked in various mines, but um, he ran afoul of, of, because look, I mean, in terms of, of uh, mining communities, local citizens wanted all Italians fired. And they were basically told, well, forget that. I mean, they're good workers. They haven't put a foot wrong. Why are we going to fire them? Um, but this one fellow got hopelessly drunk and started bragging about Mussolini. And, you know, the next thing you know, he was arrested and spent under a year um, because they were originally at uh, Camp Petawawa for just under a year. No, not Kananaska, sorry, then Petawawa, and then the hardliners, who were hardcore fascists, um, then were kept some until 1945 in, in Ripples in New Brunswick. I have uh, one last question for you. I don't know if you can answer this, but um, someone once told me because I know that the KKK made inroads into Alberta in the 1920s. Um, and someone once told me that the reason they never really got a foothold in Lethbridge was because the unions and the mining was so strong uh, and they had so many immigrants in them. Do you know if that's true during your research at all? You know, that is interesting. Um, there is a book on the Ku Klux Klan in, uh, in Alberta, in central Alberta. Um, the author sadly is deceased. I mean, I knew him really well from the Ed, uh, Red Deer area, wonderful local historian. Um, I will get hold of that book and have a look at it. But I think that, I mean, it's an interesting theory and I, I think it could very well be true. I mean, it, as you know, Italians, um, Ukrainians, Poles, I mean, all of them were very strong. Well, I mean, they were marginalized. They were at the bottom of the pecking order. Um, you know, it, it, would, it, would, it would be much later that, you know, prominent miners like um, Walter Riva and Canmore, you know, and others negotiated deals, um, you know, to sell coking coal to Japan. I mean, they were part of that a revival. Um, so you, you've got some prominent it, Italians uh, like that, but I mean, they were strong unionists. And so uh, they, and having experienced um, racism themselves, maybe that's the reason that they wouldn't have been swayed by the Ku, Ku Klux Klan I as well. I think the Ku Klux Klan didn't like Italians either. I think they also had a very- Well, that's the other thing. Well, look, I, you know, though, and what's interesting about Woodsworth is that he wrote that book, but then went on, he had enormous sympathy and of course set up, became a socialist and set up the CCF party. I mean, so, you know, it was a mentor for Tommy Douglas. I mean, so, but there you get that pecking order um, and of course, it was the nativism, which was so rampant in Alberta, and that when you hear of, well, Trump's America, you know, make America great again, it, it's make America white again. I mean, in terms of Kenny, sorry, make Alberta great again, it's make Alberta white again. And, and you know that, um, you know, there are a lot of Trump supporters in central and southern Alberta. Sounds like we need Italian unions again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's three o'clock, so. It just goes from one community to another. It does. I mean, a hundred years later. Then it was the Italians, and then it's the Afghanistans, or where, you know, the Middle East. Who knows what it's going to be 10 years from now? Okay, oh, have one more question at the back. It's always there. I'm just trying to trust some. The Michelle Hotel had a bunch of photographs in it. Um, have you ever, I don't know what happened to them. There was some of my grandfather, I'm trying to track him down. 
Oh you know, gosh, I'd love to. I'd love to see them. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, that's why I think that, you know, whenever I give these talks, I I talk to the the seniors and also the younger people that you have to capture and preserve this family history, and that if there isn't a family historian who's a logical, you know, hoarder and will preserve them give them to your local archive. Do you have so, any idea where they might have ended up, like a close archive to that hotel? If you're not so you stole the hotel and then you sold it to somebody else. So I, you know what? Why don't you email me? Um, and again, Carolyn can connect us and give me as much information as you can and then I'll, I'll look into it, okay? You know, it's kind of interesting. I just want to do a share. Okay, go ahead. I'm first generation Italian and others, and I had to learn English. But the Italians were always close, and you know, you always hear the stories, they're storytellers. You know, so my grandfather, when he immigrated, like he was in the Italian army in the cavalry. So he ended up in Saskatchewan farming, there wasn't enough money or jobs, so he ended up in the coal mines in the shell. And because he knew horses, like he had to, he couldn't speak English, but he learned every horse's name. Yeah. Um, and so he took care of all the horses that used to go into the mines. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the other generations that came, like my father and like all the Brazil and all those, when they first arrived there, they thought they arrived in hell you know, from their beautiful Italy, you know, with the fire and, you know, my mom, she went, she ended up in, her family was Toronto and faced a lot of discrimination as Italians. Yeah. Like, now, you, you know, what's interesting that you would think that, you know, with the large Italian community in Fernie and, and I mean, you know, they had this very strong society. I mean, the, in my, but I, that, in terms of those, the mind, they don't have their fraternal society records. And so at some point when the uh, fraternal society ceased operations, somebody would have had those, um, but who knows? And I mean, with Michelle Natal, I mean, you know that, and, I, and of course, I mean, you know, when my own family a lot of Calabrese, well, Grimaldese lived in Michel Natal. And so I remember yeah. around 1956 that we drove to Vancouver to visit my uncle and we stopped off there. And of course, it, you know, I had never seen this blackened landscape, mountains and black dirt and so on. Um, you know, they were working um, in, in the mines at that point. So who knows where these things ended up? But inquiries can, can be made and, you know, we might be lucky. Is the Italian community quite vibrant in Edmonton? Well, it, uh, it is interesting. Um, COVID, of course, has put a halt to all activities. And of course, I mean, there's a funeral every week. I mean, there has been, for, well, before COVID. Um, so, it, it's difficult to say what will what will emerge. There's a large like for Grimal Day say in Vancouver that get together. Well, in Vancouver, of course, I mean they've got the the you know the Italian Cultural Center, and and of course the Italian Consul is based there. So that with those activities, um, it is vibrant when uh, when. Alberta lost its consul based in Edmonton in 2009, I believe. That affected the Italian community. All right, we're at 3.05 now. So thank you so much for joining us. I'll get you in touch with those email addresses. Thank you. Bye. 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 Ciao, arrivederci.